classes I heard today. So the idea that many, many, many computing applications either behind a person or behind a machine, putting demand on a network for voice, video, and data, free of location, and then the operators such as Dave and all the guys at AT&T say, great, uh, we've got to go to a smaller reuse plan, increase the capacity of each individual site, um, intercept fewer people so that we can get the QOE and the uh, capabilities of each individual uh, demand up, and that will increase network capacity, and it will be a perfect cycle. That's what they've been after, and they're working hard at it. Uh, AT&T, among others, did lots of RAND trials, uh, not just in 2012, but particularly this year. And what that revealed was amazingly good news. The, the RAND is really wildly capable. If you look at what's coming down the pipe from Ericsson and folks like that, there's some fantastically capable RAND out there. At the same time, they ran some trials with the backhaul, and guess what, oops, it actually turns out that it's really not going to be able to keep up with what the future capability of the RAND is. Now, uh, because we have folks like Eric's in the room, they did a great idea, and they brought in something like uh, Bel Air and started adding just uh, LTE plus Wi-Fi to the matter. And so the stakes are real, have rise in terms of what is the real backhaul requirement. Now, it's not that the existing backhaul uh, doesn't work. It's that it's really not going to be sufficient for what we're going to need in 2014, 2015, and beyond. So is it, you know, is it really holding it back? There's all kinds of analysts that have written here. Brian Modoff, uh, I don't know, it looks like Brian might have stepped out, but Brian himself would tell you and mention it that backhaul is a major issue. Everyone's talked about it. So what needs to happen is this needs to go away. Now, what I want to do is start right here and say what people usually don't think about is they start thinking about backhaul and they start going from the cell site back to where it needs to go to the core. Think about it for a moment as two communities that are trying to meet in the street. You've got the mobile uh, access providers, you've got the Ethernet backhaul providers, and every single enode B, David will tell you, he writes an SLA, he sends out an RFI for every one of those enode Bs and says, this is the service level agreement that I want for that device. And whether that's provided over fast copper, whether that's provided through fiber, or whether that's provided by microwave, the SLA should not be violated. That's what needs to be met. So that's really uh, the covenant, sort of, if you would, between these two. Every one of those enode B, given its choice, would take fiber. In a perfect world, everything would be a remote radio. Home. But we don't live in a perfect world. We live in a world where fiber is pervasive, but it's not ubiquitous. And in the cases when fiber is not there, in the dense urban and urban setting, how are you going to get the SLA that exists in this known service edge through this to here? So the problem is, when you start to deploy small cell assets, which go on light poles and sides of buildings, you have what we call the urban chasm. I like this, it looks like an Alfred Hitchcock scary movie, you know? And so what, what fundamentally is the two big issues is, it's not that there's no fiber, it's that the fiber is just over there, just out of reach. And you can probably make an observation, an assumption, that that fiber is probably less than a kilometer away. Any given place where David wants to put his RAN, he needs to have freedom of location for his, for his RAN. He needs to put it exactly where it needs to go. His most valuable asset is his spectrum. When they were deploying 3G sites that were doing 10 kilometer spacing, plus or minus a few hundred uh, meters to get the backhaul of choice, no problem. That's when you're broadcasting energy. But 4G is about projecting energy to exactly where it needs to be. And so it needs to be placed exactly where it needs to go. It needs exactly this service level agreement that exists here. So when that physical void exists, and you're not on the rooftop, and you're not on a tower anymore, the standard fallback was microwave. Microwave needs line of sight. Below the roof line, below the tree line, there is no line of sight. And that's why this, what I call the freshman class of the radio world, is looking at non-line of sight solutions. So let's look at that a little deeper. Basically, a new product needs to be delivered, or a new category has to be developed. Now, before we get into what is the solution, let's continue to refine and boil the ocean here on what is the problem domain. Any solution really has to consider these cornerstones and these four elements. I think I beat this horse dead. Everybody can intuitively understand that when you come off the rooftop and come down the tree line on these trees assets, it's a non-line of sight. But here's the thing here that most people didn't understand or didn't grasp, let's say two years ago when I was starting this company and getting it funded, was that the future would be about the, the sum of LTE plus Wi-Fi. It's only recently in the last few months since people really began to embrace Wi-Fi as a, as, a, as, as a potential part of the solution, not as a competitive threat. You saw that a long time ago. And so the idea of combining those two in a single node, 
That's been further vindicated by Qualcomm buying design arts and saying now we're going to put it in a single chip core. So in 18 months or whatever the de development cycle is, every chipset you get now, every RAM that goes now is LTE and Wi-Fi. So from a backhaul point of view, it's not what LTE can deliver, it's what LTE plus .11ac can deliver. That's the minimum capacity you need to be designing to. Next, the number, this was talked about uh, in great detail today, the number of managed elements per square kilometer, the density of elements per square kilometer is going up dramatically. So the only way you're really going to deploy systems like this is if they are part of an end-to-end -end solution. There's no solution that I can develop or John can develop that stands alone. It's going to be integrated and tied into something else. And this gentleman right here, I'm sure, will talk about QOE. is done by end-to-end -end management. End-to-end -end management needs to be done carefully and purposely. So the number of managed elements. This also speaks to the density of the radio deployments. If, you do, if everyone worries about backhauls, licenses and unlicensed, you deploy enough un, uh, licensed spectrum in a dense urban, urban environment, it's all going to interfere. So actually, over time, it blurs. It doesn't matter. You need to design to a dense environment, which means you have to handle it all. This one is probably the, uh, the one that's hiding and lurking is going to hurt the most. 4G and 3G are going to have to be very tightly synchronized in order for them to cooperate with one another. They'll have their own radio synchronization issues or interference issues. Timing and synchronization typically is assured through GPS. We have one of the greatest inventors of GPS amongst us. But you're not going to guarantee GPS everywhere. This, this uh, previous session said it's not one thing, it's the combination of many things that will get you there. Likewise with this. GPS won't be fully reliable or adequate itself, so the day of packet timing protocol 1588, Sinky, and all these things are upon us. And it's going to be a combination of those things. But timing and synchronization are critical. Anyone who's providing a backhaul system today that's going to make Mr. Walter happy has to simultaneously solve all four of these in order for him to have the confidence to have the free location for his RAN and to be able to meet in the street. And one more view of this, if ultimately then he wants free location to deploy his small cell assets, LTE plus Wi-Fi, anywhere they need to be, and they're not going to go in in some planned grid. They're going to go in as triage. It's going to be remove some pain or pressure here, remove some here, and when you put the next element in between, you can't break the whole thing. So what's going to have to happen is, is you put them in, you're going to have an urban chasm, you want to push this SLA all the way through there, the timing, the synchronization, the things that allow it to scale, like MPLS and MPLSTP, you're going to have to have a radio system that isn't designed just for line of sight, or just for near line of sight, or just for non line of sight. He wants to dispatch a truck with guys in it that don't get out there and go, oh, we got, did you bring the line of sight radio with you? You have to have a system that's maximally flexible that can be deployed in any scenario. And once it's deployed, if the circumstances change, a building goes up, a tree blooms, it can handle that. You need what's called any line of sight. And any line of sight with no compromise on what the SLA is. And this is what we've introduced uh, at Fastback Networks, is that the sum total of everything I just described to you is what we call the anywhere service edge. That's what needs to come to the fore to solve the small cell lack. Now, the last slide is to put it all into context and reinforce what I said previously. Anyone who developed the construct that I just described doesn't put it out there by itself. Ultimately, it's part of what already exists today. There's all of the cell site infrastructure that exists. There's the cell site routers that exist. And whether you look at this as an aggregation function back, or I prefer to look at it as, as a fan out for capability. <coughs> Everything that we did at Fastback was to stop thinking this as backhaul and looked at it more as service edge extension. The idea if you do it that way, then you start to look at the Ethernet backhaul provider community as people who can jump in here and take some of the burden off. Why should it be all of your problem to figure out how to get connected back? Because every one of them has a giant multi-billion dollar opportunity for small cell backhaul as a service. And what's brilliant about taking it from this way out is if an individual Ethernet backhaul provider does that, and this is a turf war. There, are, there isn't an infinite number of street assets, and everybody can't go out and put whatever they want in every asset. Municipal uh, city councils may have a say about what goes on there. So the idea of multi-tenant or concentration or integration of things, doing things efficiently, matters. So designing it not single-mindedly from this way back, but designing it 
from an Ethernet backhaul provider's way out gets you with a platform that is capable of supporting multiple service providers and give you maximum flexibility and maximum efficiency in terms of what's ultimately out there. Scalable. And you don't have to put it all out at once. You can put it out, physically gain the pole position, and then turn on what you need as either time goes by, demand increases, or the number of tenants or sophistication of feature group uh, materializes. That's our perspective. Jeff, I think that was the fastest one all day. <laughs> and I uh, bet you right back on time. This is great. We have time for some questions. People can ask Kevin some questions about his company, their solution, any any other questions? If I work for uh, David, I would, I would say the analogy is you're going to go play golf and you're not going to shoot the best round of your life with a seven iron and drive. You might. I will. Um, so I look at all of those things like clubs in a bag. And it's not like he doesn't have a nice set of golf clubs. It's that he needs a new driver or he needs a new driver. Or he can't really do what he needs to do. So there's a lot of great companies out there doing 60 gigabytes. Um, there's more coming. There's concepts out there. It can have its place. If I could snap my fingers and say my company's three, four, five years down the road from now, I'd love to have a little bit of everything. Um, but right now, we're focusing on what I call the missing link, no pun intended. Um, but this is the part that's missing, is the ability to go around corners. If you were an Ethernet backhaul provider, if, if you're AT&T Wireline, I'd say, well, yours ends, mine bends. Zigzagging through the streets with something that's what I call hyperlinocyte works, but you need a lot more pole knots. But in this world, what's going to happen is the next Randy puts down is in, the, is in the street. The service is in the alley. That's only a few hundred meters away, but you've got to bend and bounce and do carom and bank shots. That's what we're all about. We're going to solve that problem with no compromise to the SLA in a way that looks more like the enterprise, moves, adds, and changes. It's a data networking platform with a wireless port so that you can infinitely scale that. If that's augmented with traditional microwave, E-band, free space optics, they're smart guys. They'll do it. This gentleman's got a company, you know, one of the most creative parts of his business is his managed service provider business. And they, they make those choices every day. They help him figure all that out. So I, I wouldn't pick a favorite on this. I, I, would, I would tell them, I just want to create something that's missing, something that has great value out, and you use it together in combination of things. There's uh, one last thing on this. The, uh, the Crown Castle folks are here. Think of those as veins and arcs, right? Those are veins and arteries. They need capillaries to get down inside, down and squeeze in between the places. So that's what this is all about. Yeah, you're, um, you're asking me to become an advocate for 60 gig. What I'd rather do is tell you the non-line of sight uh, small cell backhaul problem is a sub-6 gig problem. Um, laws of physics, uh, once you get uh, above 6, it's, it just doesn't bend and it doesn't react very well. Um, at 60 gig, you have atmospheric issues, but there's smart people working on that. Again, um, there are there's, um, economic advantages, there are modems that are available, there are certain uh, behavioral and economic advantages that exist, I think, much more favorably for these applications at the 60 gig and the sub-6 gig than all that stuff in the middle. And remember, I was at Pro not remember, I was at Proxim, we sold all, we sold all that stuff. I sold hundreds of millions of dollars in microwave radios when coverage was the issue, when they were going from tower to tower, and they were up high and wanted to get to the next one and the next one. This isn't a coverage problem anymore, this is a capacity problem. It'll initially be a 4G coverage problem, but then it'll be a 4G density co uh, capacity problem. All of the above, but gotta use the right one. Right now there's a big piece missing and that's that's what we're going to see. Kevin, thanks a lot for coming. Thanks. Thank